Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That's, I don't see you, Gay, but I hear you. I know. I don't know what, oh, because the video. Sorry, I didn't uh, read the video. That's there, right. There. <laughs> okay. Is that morning. Toto? Hey, this is Toto. Good morning. Oh, yeah, this oh, is Toto. How sweet. What a cutie. Yeah, yeah. darling dog. He's my best dog friend. He's the canine face of God. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in the guest room at my best friend Richard's house, which is about 15 minutes from where I live. So I'm here oh. for the weekend, and he's going <laughs> to sit in on the part of this session until he has other things to do. <laughs> oh. We sat out, uh, there, we're on a little golf course. We sat out in the back and watched the golfers. Where we said our prayers and prepared for the class, and a coyote came up onto the course. So he's already been busy this morning chasing off a coyote. Let's see. Thank goodness he got the coyote instead of the coyote getting him. They do. Yeah, you have to be careful here to uh, mm -hmm. not only with coyotes, but um, hawks uh -huh. and owls. He's mm -hmm. he's eight pounds, so it would take a lot for a hawk to fly off with him. But uh, it happens here. Yeah, I've heard of it happening. Yeah. Good morning. Hey, who's that? Chris. Oh, you found me, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, texting late at night. I had one eye open when I was doing that, but uh, they were saying, "Hey, where's the record? Where's the Zoom link? And where's the YouTube?" So, uh, just so you know, from now on, the same Zoom link that you use today, you use for every session. So, um, tattoo it to your forehead. <laughs> Save it someplace where you always know. I know exactly how to get on that call because I know exactly where I put that Zoom link. And then the YouTube thing is just nothing but uh, the same thing. It's you'll use, and it's if you and if you don't have the link, you could probably go on YouTube and say, "Hey, where's Father Nathan Castle?" and it would get you there. Are you at Father Richards? I see you've got Toto. <laughs> yeah, I was just mentioning. I'm uh, during the pandemic. Um, I've been really fortunate in that my best friend and best dog friend live just 15 <laughs> minutes away, and I'm here usually two nights a week, uh, and then. I have my Dominican house where I am, and then my sister and brother-in-law live here also. So I've been able to move around. My bubble has uh, got three different components. Oh, so, good. Yeah. And I was supposed to get my second shot on Friday, but that storm all through the Midwest and Texas uh, <laughs> clogged up the roads, I guess. And so I'm now scheduled for Tuesday for shot number two. Oh yeah, my second is Monday. I'm wondering if the vaccine made it from wherever it's coming from. Yeah. Well, I wondered, they say that um, that the second one can set you back for a day. Uh, right. and I had the second one. Did you, Daffrey? Yeah, and um, the first one, I didn't feel anything at all. And the second one, I was really tired for about two days, you know? Was it uh, Pfizer and Moderna or which one? It was Pfizer. And um, mm -hmm. the, I was worried, you know, I thought, well, I'm always tired anyway, but um, my godson is 34, he's a teacher, and we got it at the same time, and he was tired too. So I thought, mm. it's not me. But you know, you can be tired, just sit in bed and read and watch TV and whatever. Well, if I had had it yesterday afternoon, I might have been tired and sluggish this morning. <laughs> so uh, uh -oh. you're getting me uh, uh, at my best. Uh, and when I do get the shot, it's on Tuesday at 9.30, and I wouldn't have a session until the following morning so i'd have 24 hours afterwards so. uh, that's when it hits father <laughs> is that right okay well one of these days <laughs> okay wait to see what i look like after that but you pfizer or moderna uh mine is moderna okay we had pfizer on wednesday and it was just innocuous we had no problem whatsoever uh-huh well my um, doctor daughter tells me that as we age, our immune system isn't as strong as it used to be. So you have less of an effect with the antibodies coming in because you don't have an immune system that can react as- Was that your say, second? Generously, yes. Yeah. As generously as it could when you were 40 years younger. All right, well, make a mental note. There's one uh, positive to aging, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, now recall um, that today is a lecture, uh, a one hour lecture, we're mostly in chapter two. And then for any who want to 
join in on the Q&A and interactive part. That's tomorrow at this same time, Sunday at 10 a.m. Same Zoom link. Uh, this, uh, as you might know, on um, Wednesday when I did the session, my uh, my friend Sammy was uh, had had surgery the day before and didn't monitor this call, and I forgot <laughs> to push the record button. So uh, there was no recording of it. So I redid it uh, on Thursday. Uh, and and that is now both the three hour session and that session are on my YouTube channel. And this one today, now there's an automatic preset so that as soon as it <laughs> go on, I don't have to remember to push a record button. It knows how to do that. And it knows how to send it to my tech guy. So this, all of this uh, pandemic driven tech is, uh, you know, another, another little score bit by bit by bit. So uh, this, no. this session might be on YouTube by the uh, late afternoon today, depending upon how, um, how my friend Joe gets to it, to uh, post hmm. it there and edit it just a little bit. All right, we're, um, we, let's see, I got to let a few more people in. <clears throat> How is Sammy doing? Um, he his surgery went just fine. He has more um, of an issue with the uh, pain killing drugs, you know, mm. uh, how sluggish they make you feel, and you know mm -hmm. all of that. But he's had yeah. many uh, health issues his entire life, and so he's one of those people uh. that's just kind of used to the routines that come with <clears throat> medical interventions are being done. Uh, okay. So I'm going to get us started with a prayer, and uh, I think by now you might be getting accustomed to my particular way of praying into these things, which is largely a litany, a list, gathering um, spiritual friends, think of myself as and us as being protected, <clears throat> uh, being spiritually open and free and receptive to what the Holy Spirit might want to tell us, surrounding ourselves with um, with spiritual friends. And some of those are famous ones. Uh, I like when I'm doing a study of scripture to mention uh, everybody in the story, not only the named ones, the unnamed ones who have who get mentioned, and then the ones that are in our crowd in the background, okay, the, the entire cast and crew. Uh, so, and then I also like to include members of my family line. Yesterday was my dad's 100th birthday. He died. Uh, at the age of 76, but still I've marked the fact that it was 100 years ago that he came here. So shall we? We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I call on Holy um, St. Michael the Archangel to stand guard over me and all of us and help us uh, go about our work here. I call on Holy Mary, Mother of all, that uh, she and Joseph might be here with us. I call on my Holy Father, St. Dominic and St. Francis, St. Rose of Lima, St. Thomas Aquinas, call on um, Mark the Evangelist or whoever it was that actually put pen to scroll and gave us this text to study and to help us grow. I call on all the people in the story who would like to be with us, all the members of our family line, those known to us and those who preceded us, who were in the light and who would like to be with us. We'd like to uh, invite the prophets, St. John the Baptist, Isaiah and Elijah. We leave a place for you at the table. I'd ask you uh, now to just in your own heart of hearts, include any who you would like to have in your space. Remember, they don't have to be thought of as in the stratosphere or in some distant place. You can invite them to be in the room where you are, which makes it easier. It's nice to have ones you love close at hand and next to your heart. So we gather all these and ask Holy Spirit that you give us gracious listening, gracious speaking, gracious direction for the way we spend our time together. 
And we ask that you help us be especially receptive to the message that you might like to speak to us specifically. We ask all of this, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I'd like you to, uh, when when we do these lecture series uh, uh, sessions, to have some writing material nearby. So if you don't have something to write with, I'd recommend that you uh, find that if, if, if there's something near at hand that you could use. Um, I will reiterate that from now on, uh, the same Zoom link that you use today will use all the way through the entire series. The YouTube link will always be the place that you can direct, you can go back to to look at something again. Uh, see a session that you that had a, that you weren't able to see live, uh, or to recommend to someone else. And as I'm teaching, I'm I'm talking to. Uh, I suppose you could be called the choir. A lot of you I met at church, um, but by posting it on YouTube, it's out there for uh, everybody's everything. And so I'm I'm gonna I'm trying to consciously speak not only to those uh, of you who might be already well versed in the Gospels and in um, congregational life, perhaps as a Christian. Um, but I'm also trying to speak to people who might just be doodling around online and, and find their way here and, and maybe uh, find this beneficial. So today, the study that I'm doing, uh, for those of you that might be viewing this on, you want to get down, bud? Why don't you go? See? Um, let me let him out. <laughs> Sometimes when he sits with me here, he looks out the window and sees well, there are a lot of dog walkers in this neighborhood and it, he doesn't like any other dogs walking around here. So he's gonna go and do his own thing for a little while. Um, I am doing a pastoral study. I'm, I've been a pastor most of my life uh, on campus ministries uh, in the West on campuses. So I'm used to being a, a pastoral leader that comes from the idea of being a shepherd and one of the principal things that a shepherd does is lead the flock to nourishment, to food. Uh, to, uh, so I believe my role is to lead you to spiritual food through a kind of a quasi-academic study. Um, I'm not just sharing my musings or um, I'm, I'm taking good scholarship. I'm studying it, trying to to break it down into bullet points. Uh, I'm not a professional scripture scholar, but in addition to the standard master divinity that most, uh, Catholic, well, all Catholic priests get and many other uh, Christian clergy get, I did a second MA in adult education in scripture in order to do this kind of thing. I always wanted to be able to teach scripture at a, pop, to, at a popular audience level, uh, but not too dumbed down. I wanted to, to have the kind of, uh, the kind of scholarship I appreciate when I when I took electives in college, I very often wanted to take something in a discipline that I knew very little about, but that was popularized. Uh, and one of the things that disappointed me was there wasn't anything in popular biology. I, I'm, I'm looking at a few couple of nurses here on the screen. Uh, um, I just I just uh, made Spike smile because she's a nurse. Um, and I always wanted to know why does an aspirin work? What does it do? When I have a fever, what's my body doing? And should I want to break the fever or let the fever run its course? I just wanted sort of a consumer biology lesson, but that I never found it. I'm now almost 65 and I never found that course. But I'm interested in trying to take a discipline uh, that, that in this case that I've studied and then try to make it popular and understandable to people who are never going to have the time or the inclination to devote a lot of, of, of energy toward it. So this is kind of a generalistic approach to what I'm doing. We're also doing this at the beginning of Lent. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with Lent, haven't done it before, it comes from the word lengthen, because in the Northern Hemisphere, where Judaism and Christianity have had their roots and have lived out much of their history, uh, the the it's the it's we're nearing the growing season. If you're in agriculture, it's time to get busy and prepare things so that when it's time to plant the seed, 
uh, you'll have everything organized and ready to go. So Lent is about that. It's about um, being the seed, preparing oneself for the growth spurt. And, and then that involves um, working with your creator about, hmm, I'm not a free agent in the world. I didn't invent myself. I didn't create myself. I didn't get here all on my own. I'm here because I was placed here uh, and uh, for some purpose. How do I know what my next purpose is so that I might spend all of my best energy into growing the new sprout, the new branch of me? So to me, that's what the Lent, the Lent season does. Uh, you might be aware that it's 40 days long. That, that excludes the Sundays. If you add back the Sundays, it's 46 days. Um, it leads us all the way into what we call the Triduum, which is Latin for three days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then to the grand feast of Easter. So we'll be, and Easter for us starts on a Sunday, but then it runs for 50 days. Uh, we ponder the Easter message over another 50 days after that day when we do the egg hunt and the brunch. We, we start that way, but then we do a whole bunch of other pondering of it uh, for the next 50 days. Lent has three primary, sometimes called a, um, a tripod. Uh, length has, uh, Lent has three spiritual practices embedded in it. The one that's most popularly known is giving up some food or drink, some sort of fasting. All right. That that's partly to get our attention because our stomachs get our attention when we don't put something in them. And so there can be a grumbling, a rumbling from inside you that says, uh, feed me, feed me. And when we deny ourselves with a, a, a simple fast, it's simply a way to bring our consciousness in line with what our body can tell it that um, I need something. I need to be filled with something. And on the spiritual plane, that that little bit of hunger that's self-induced by, by uh, reducing our food intake or our drink, just it, it brings us to a level of consciousness that says, oh yeah, instead of going for a snack, I think I will sit still and say a prayer. Prayer is the next part of uh, the, the I, we pray all the time, at least those of us who have that practice regularly, but, um, Prayer, especially a prayer of listening in Lent is especially important. Uh, Jesus says um, in Matthew's gospel, um, go to your room and close the door and speak to your heavenly father in secret. If he was doing it now, he might say, um, disconnect from your, uh, your technology, leave the cell phone in the other room, uh, disconnect from all the social media and every other thing that competes for your attention, just come and be with me come and sit still. It's not that different for those of you that have a great love in your life, a spouse, or as I do, a, a good friend. Uh, you, um, those relationships are not to be taken for granted. And even though a lot of our days are busy with uh, events and commitments and so on, it's also important to take one-on-one -on -one time to let a relationship uh, deepen. And so Jesus says, go to your room, speak to your heavenly father in secret, or listen to your heavenly father in secret. So prayer or fasting, prayer. And the last one is almsgiving. That is taking what we have as a resource and making sure that we don't think of it as something that we must guard and, uh, and hoard, but that in the Lenten season, the way that the seed needs to break open in order that what's inside of it can grow, we allow... Um, the consciousness of, of encasing what's precious, like putting money in a safe, that I have precious gifts of time, talent, and treasure. And rather than only uh, safeguarding them for my own use or um, that, I, that I open up and that my time, my talent, my treasure becomes available to other people in a way that um, might create some newness in me. Finally, one last thing before we go into the specifics of today's uh, text, the text that we're going to study today at the beginning of chapter two of Mark are called opposition stories. So think of an opponent. 
okay? It shouldn't be difficult for us to have some recent experience of oppositional energy, of people having a kind of knee-jerk reaction to something and thinking of others whom we oppose. Particularly in our contemporary politics, I'm almost 65, um, it's very tempting for us to move away from the unit of consciousness that I believe is built into the universe. The universe is one. And um, even though we might have uh, differences of gender or age or economics or um, language or location, um, we don't need to be defined by separation distance, separateness, because we're capable of unity, of oneness. And some of that, in, uh, what it always involves some humility on one's own part that my opinions and those of my tribe, my clan, my favorite group uh, are, because I hold them, they're more important than those of others. Um, I, I, as a Catholic, Catholic means universal, uh, and uh, when it's when 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 it's used with a capital C, it usually denotes a smaller group. One point four billion people out of eight billion on the planet are Catholic, with a big C. With a little C, it means universal, and it just means everybody. So ideas of of uh, co being conscious of being a part of the whole are going to run through the stories that we're going to deal with today. And then uh, some of those are going to be because of the difference of being Jew or Gentile. Those two categories, that's a Jewish construct that those of us who are in group are Jews. Everybody else who's not a Jew is a Gentile. Doesn't matter what kind of Gentile they are, the categories are simply two, Jew and Gentile. So you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. And then the Gentiles, there might be a billion kinds of them, but they're just all Gentiles. Jesus is going to be going to be raised Jewish. He's going to move into that world. And he's going to do sort of what you and I have to do. We navigate the world that is around us because we don't get to completely construct it according to our own wishes. How different would the world be if you could just change stuff in it like that? make people you don't like stop thinking that way or doing that way or whatever. Jesus didn't get to do that either. He came into a context. It had a bunch of presets, like that experience uh, of uh, when the game goes into overtime or extra innings uh, and it runs, it bleeds over past the top of the hour. The broadcaster might have to say at the end of it, uh, the game's over. Now we join this other program already in progress maybe 12 minutes after the hour. Well, you and I were born at a certain time to a world already in progress. You didn't get to invent your parents, your family of origin, your economic status, any of the variables about you and neither did Jesus. The world had lots of presets going already. So uh, we're gonna start into the text today at the beginning of chapter two. So if you have a Bible with you and you want to follow along, that's great. But remember, uh, the original experience of receiving the gospel was, was auditory to begin with. Most people couldn't read. And even if they did, having a copy of a printed scroll would have been hugely expensive. And so they were usually held only in a public place like a synagogue. So you might be able to go to your synagogue where there actually is a copy, but you might have known, not known how to read it. And if you did, um, you might have not been given access to it. It it would have been a precious thing that was probably, uh, you know, locked up and brought out uh, only by persons who had the authority to care for it. Nevertheless, uh, if you remember, uh, we at, at the end of chapter one, there were some miracles. There was a healing of uh, Peter's mother-in-law, the casting out of some demons. A leper was uh, healed and told, don't say anything to anybody, go back to your people uh, and don't tell anybody about this. And instead the guy uh, tells everybody he can find. As a result, Jesus is no longer to enter a town openly. He stays in desert places. 
yet people are coming to him from all sides. So it's only the end of chapter one and chapter two, but we're already seeing that wherever Jesus goes, there is a crowd. And there is today. So ready? Beginning of chapter two, he comes back to Capernaum after a lapse of several days and word gets around that he's at home. So we know that he was Jesus of Nazareth, but um, somewhere between uh, his early childhood and his adult ministry, uh, Capernaum becomes his home. It's his home base. And we're, we're not, never told that he had his own house, uh, but, he, uh, it, it, but it was his place. So he comes back to Capernaum after a, a lapse of several days and word gets around that he's at home. At that, they begin gathering in great numbers. There's no longer any room for them even around the door. Uh, one translation says the gate, which I think is really probably, um, uh, like people here in Southern Arizona, a lot of our homes, mine, I have, I have a, a patio space that's as large as my living room. That's common here because the weather is pleasant so much of the time that it has an in and out, out in lifestyle, much the way that Southern California, some of you are from there, uh, has an in and out lifestyle that's uh, livable for much of the year. That was, that was the case in Capernaum. While he was delivering God's word to them, some people began, then some people arrived bringing a paralyzed man to him. The four who carry him are unable to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they begin to open up the roof over the spot where Jesus was. Um, let's see. I'm going to ask you if you want to, to unmute, especially if you're in a room that doesn't have extraneous noise. And should you need to sneeze or cough, mute yourself before. You wouldn't sneeze in my face. Don't cough in my ear. Okay. So if you need to do anything like that, try to mute yourself before. If you can remember, that's on the lower left of your screen. Um, but um, do any of you, what he, he, it says that, um, he opens up the roof over the spot where Jesus was. Do you remember from chapter one, something above opening? Spikes, you're not on mic, but you're talking to yourself. The heavens split the heaven. Yeah, the heavens split open at the baptism. One of the impacts of Jesus in the world is that that perceived um, um, dualistic thinking that the world is up and down there's an up where god lives and a down where we live there's a heaven above and an earth below uh, part of the impact of jesus coming into the world is shifting that category can you imagine a world where heaven and earth blend together can you imagine a world where god and you blend together uh, where you're not working in a media like stained glass with black lead running between the blue and the red panes of glass, something more like a watercolor. Elaine, I'm looking at you. Can you imagine yourself being a watercolor? Yes. Yeah, that you and God blend together and yes. you and your neighbors blend mm -hmm. together and so on. Even though you clearly also have distinctiveness, you are you and nobody else is you. So it's not that, it, that that's untrue. It's really just a matter of consciousness and how you choose to be in the world. So Jesus is, and even Jesus, we believe, is this combination of divinity and humanity, more watercolor than a stained glass. So in the story... Uh, We're not separated. We're one. Uh, and, 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 but watch how opposition works in this text that we're doing here because people presume separation and they even insist on it. They don't want blurring. Uh, did any of you as children or did you raise children that pitched a fit if the green peas touched the mashed potatoes? Yes. <laughs> some, even in childhood, some people can have sort of a, a, a constitutional predisposition to want 
things separated from other things. So I remember my two nephews, um, Dan might be joining us. I remember when he and Matthew, my two eldest nephews lived in the same room. Uh, one was clean and one was not was messy. And Dan took duct <laughs> tape and taped a line down the wall and up the carpet and up the desk and everything <laughs> to, to delineate which part of the room was his because he didn't want to have all that mess on, on his side. Um, that sometimes we wish we could make the whole world like that. Um, and some people, that's a very strong, uh, if not compulsion, it's a very strong attitude in their heart that they want uh, division and clear lines. And really that was kind of um, very typical of Judaism and for an understandable reason. In the ancient world, the Jews were the only monotheists. Everybody around them had religious beliefs, but everybody around them was polytheistic, including the Roman Empire. Think of how many gods and goddesses there are in the Roman uh, pantheon. The Jews were insistent, uh, and the first commandment is, you know, I am the Lord your God, you ha shall have no other gods, that I am one. And so they were, they, they had a lot of rules to separate themselves from their surrounding neighbors, many of whom uh, overrode them and marauded them and uh, overtook them in wars. The Jews may be part of the reason that they didn't disappear as so many other ancient groups did is because this stubbornness of uh, being separate and distinct. But it, it can also come up to bite you um, as I think it's doing in my home state of Texas right now, which is very proud of being the Lone Star State. Uh, but when you go your own way and insist that you're not going to you're, you're going to downplay the part of being a part of the, the lot larger union. Well, there's there's pros and cons to that. And having grown up there, I can appreciate it. Being taught in fourth grade Texas history that we were our own country, damn it. And you know we're different than everybody else and so on. Uh, but Georgia and New York were different from each other in 1776. And But they looked around and said, as different as you are from me, I see similarities and I think we'd be stronger if we were... Um, united. So this it's not just a political idea, a religious idea, it, it just runs through everything. Am I, am I part of the two or am I part of the one? Am I dualistically thinking or am I unitively thinking? And I find that when I drift into dualistic thinking, I'm more judgmental. Okay. Um, it's easier for, if I decide that I'm not you, it's much easier to judge you. If I start from unitive thinking and think um, <clears throat> Margaret's part of me, boy, she sure annoyed me with that thing she said or did, but uh, she's not my enemy. And even if she were, Jesus would tell me to love my enemy. You, know? you don't have to sign up for this, <laughs> but if you're gonna be a follower of Jesus, I think you have to kind of listen to what he says and do things the way he wants them done. So anyway, enough of that. I, I warned you that I'm a pastor and a preacher and, uh, <laughs> secondarily a teacher I can hardly stay in the text but anyway they 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 open up the roof above him and I think that has that that breaking through energy to it but the roof doesn't break open on its own it breaks open because four people were willing to carry the burden of one who couldn't take care of himself so there was unitive thinking there the the paralytic circumstance of my friend is my issue and they become an extension of his body. They move his body that can't move on its own. And they, they unite with him for this mission. Uh, and the mission is to get him into the presence of Jesus. And it's ironic in Mark that what prevents them from getting close to Jesus? <gasps> right, the followers of Jesus. The, the followers of Jesus make it difficult to get to Jesus, right? <laughs> <laughs> Write that down if you're a follower of Jesus. Yes. Ask yourself that question. Do I, do I, as a follower of Jesus, by anything about the way I position myself in the world, anything I say or do or where I live or am, am I an obstacle to people coming toward Jesus, especially if they have a lower status? In the ancient world, illness was often conflated with sin and spiritual problems. That, that if you have a physical illness, it's somehow reflective of your status with God. God must be displeased with you 
because of this. Anyway, they bring the paralyzed man. Uh, they, um, they open the roof over the spot where Jesus was. <coughs> they make a hole and they let the mat down on which he was lying. And Jesus sees their faith. Right? Pay attention in the text that there's no reaction from the crowd going, who the hell told you you could take the roof off? Um, there's, it isn't so much a crowd reaction event right now, it's Jesus noticing faith hmm. and the lengths to which someone or a group of people will go to demonstrate their faith and, their, and the way that their faith can overcome what appears to be an insurmountable obstacle. You might make a note to yourself, where do I think there are barriers that prevent my movement? In what ways am I at all paralyzed? Is there anything that in my world that I feel immobilizes me in a way that reduces me? Right? Jesus sees their faith and he says to the paralyzed man, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes are sitting there asking themselves, why does this man talk in that way? He commits blasphemy. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Let me ask you, I'm looking at about 25 of you on my current screen. Um, have any of you ever forgiven sin? I think I'm the only priest on the call. I have. <laughs> Nancy Knurk, I can see you. Have you ever forgiven sin? But you're not, you're muted. I have not. I have not. Haven't you? Come on. I'm not no, going to ask you in public yes, how old you are, but I have a pretty I guess good I idea. Have. I, have forgiven, I have forgiven friends who have sinned against me, yes. That's my point, sweetie. <laughs> we, we all have the authority to forgive sin when we're its victim. Mm -hmm. Especially mothers. Especially mm -hmm. mothers, okay. With their children. All right. If they make, they do something that, harm themselves you have to let them know that you still love them no matter what it's going to be okay and let's go forward from here all right you hurt me but i'm forgiving you but don't do that again mm -hmm. all right well, yeah. I, when at the end of a confession a catholic priest like myself the formula is um nancy i absolve you of all of the sins that you just spoke in my presence in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit that's, I'm limited to that. That's quite a lot, but it's still delimited. I do it in the names of God understood to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, what I don't have the authority to do is to offer forgiveness on the part of the person you offended. The formula doesn't say, if, if your husband, Bert, was the person that you sinned against. I don't at the end of the confession say, I absolve you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Bert. Because I don't have authority to do that. I have the authority. I'm given this godly authority to, to forgive in God's name, but there might still be unfinished business. And then that's between you and the person that you offend. And if it's possible, uh, to go to them and ask forgiveness, then you do that. Sometimes it's been, it, it, you, in, in longer term stuff that happens during Lent, sometimes people need to ask forgiveness of a deceased loved one, in which case I offer to have them, you know, write things down, uh, offer it up in prayer. There are ways to break through, you know, the sky splits, the roof opens, Prayer can break through a perception of a boundary, even one that has, is there because of the death of a loved one. Anyway, back to the text. They, they say, who, who can forgive sins but God alone? They're stuck. Uh, and, and it also says um, there were some scribes sitting there. And today, I, in the study that I did this morning, uh, a commentator said, the fact that they were sitting in a place that was so obviously overcrowded suggests that they thought themselves entitled to a seat where everybody else stood, okay? And it presumes a seat of authority. Can you think of places where a chair has a symbolic role of making its importance or the importance of the one who sits in it known? 
Where are there important chairs? Mass. At mass. In fact, do you know the word, the Latin word for chair is cathedra? Or, uh, uh, and a cathedral is the place where the bishop's chair is. And some bishops will preach sitting from the chair when they feel like they have something very authoritative to say that they want to make sure that you don't understand is just their opinion. They sit and speak from the chair. It's called to speak ex cathedra. When there's big, what about a courtroom? Yeah. <laughs> the lawyers walk around, the judge has a seat, and oh, by the way, so do the jurors. <laughs> because they have an important role here to listen, hear, and uh, authoritatively decide. So the in this setting, these uh, scribes are sitting asking themselves, why does he talk that way? Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. Jesus was immediately aware, I'm now at verse 8, he's immediately aware of their reasoning, though they kept it to themselves, and he said to them, why do you harbor these thoughts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, hey, stand up, pick up your mat and walk again, that you may have authority that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So Jesus explicitly in the scene is willing to go with that idea of uh, sin and brokenness, even bodily brokenness, having some connection because he's working with what he was given to work with. That's their starting place. So he starts where they are and says, okay, if we're gonna think of it that way, then which is easier to say? I forgive you invisible sins in the confessional when I wave my hand. There's not spirit dust, you know, there's there's not an electrical current, there's there's nothing visible other than the gesture of my hand. That's all you see. Uh it it, it does a call of a kind of a wiping away, but it's still a a a, 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 a reality that's beyond vision. So Jesus says, which is easier to do that or to, to say to a paralyzed man who had to be let in through the roof, stand up and walk, but so that you may understand that the son of man has an authority on earth to forgive sin. He says to the paralyzed man, I command you rise up, pick up your mat and go home. The man stood and picked up his mat and he went outside in the sight of everyone. So even though this is a healing story, it's in a context of uh, oppositional energy. He even says as much. It's not, Jesus doesn't have a lot of bedside manner in this scene. He's not really even talking to the, the paralyzed man very much. He's really talking to the objectors over there sitting on their judgment seat. So yes, it's a healing story, but the way that it really functions is an opposition story. The man stood, he rose, he picked up his mat, and he went outside in the sight of everybody. He, they were awestruck. Everybody gave, and Mark loves uh, uh, universal language. Everybody, Panta, uh, everybody, everything, everywhere, he, he, he tends to speak that way. They were all awestruck, and they gave praise to God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Note, too, that they don't give praise to Jesus. It says they gave praise to God for the thing that Jesus just did in front of them. And when, when, the, when the Christic community, when the baptized Christian community understands that it doesn't worship Christ as an object in space, but that as one who's entered into them, and that Christ acts through them. When something marvelous moves through them, they, one of the things that I do is I say the glory be. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the, if you say to me, that was marvelous, what you just did, well, I can, I can say thank you, but in the doing, I also want to say glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus doesn't collect unto himself, nor do they move towards 
thanking Jesus, what they do is thank God. So that's kind of a model for how Mark would like us to behave. We've never seen anything like this. Now, what I'd like you to do on that piece of paper that I invited you to go look for, I want you to draw a big X. Yes. Okay, That's a big X on a sheet of paper. Uh, in English, we call that X letter. In Greek, that same shaped thing, do you know the name of it in the Greek alphabet? Do you know it from, if you were in a fraternity or sorority or studied Greek? I, I. Chi. It's the Greek letter chi. And it sounds, it makes the same, that hard sound, ka. It's from the back of the throat. And in, in, when it's written in, uh, when, when it's transliterated from Greek into English, it becomes ch. But the hard ch sound, Christ. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, go we're go I'm gonna show you what a chiasm is, C-H-I-A-S-M. Um, because this chapter two has what's called a chiastic structure. It's structured like an X. Um, have you ever had to stand and recite something or have you ever had to sing the national anthem into a microphone mm -hmm. without the words in front of you? Or have you ever had to recite a rhyming poem without the text in front of you? Or sing a lyric, any lyric that rhymes without having it in front of you? Um, like most Catholics would be horrified if you ask them to stand up and say the Nicene Creed on their own in front of a group. For one thing, we changed the language of it a few years ago and we still stumble over the, the Gloria and the creeds and so on. Um, but imagine yourself having to do the Star Spangled Banner. Let's say, uh, let's see by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming. Gleaming, what does gleaming rhymed with? Gleaming. Mm -hmm. Seeming. Streaming. Remember? Seeming. Uh, isn't that twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the paradise light or the ramparts we watch was so gallantly streaming. So you know how sometimes if there's a if you're trying to if you're using some literature that has rhymes built into it, if only you can remember the first half of the rhyme. <laughs> You can often, it will lead you to the second half. You know what I'm talking about? If you can remember that sound, there's another sound coming up that matches it and it might just be a mnemonic, a memory device that gets you to remember that other thing. Uh, I was taught in preaching, I very rarely preach from a printed text. Uh, and I've, I've been taught how to create mnemonic memory devices so that the thought that I started with and the start, the thought that I end with cohere and that there's something that makes the strands in between work. And in constructing a homily, you want to, you're supposed to be able to say what it's about. If, for example, at a mass where I'm not the homilist, I'm only the presider, I might go to the homilist and say, Chris, what's your homily about? And I want you to be able to tell me in a sentence or two what its main theme is. If you can't, you probably got, it's gonna be a mess. <laughs> if you can't, <laughs> say in, can't say in a word or two what you're gonna say. Did you ever learn that thing in, in speech class about uh, say what you're gonna say, say it and say what you said? That's a, that's a basic of public speaking. Say what you're gonna say, say it, say what you said. Chapter two is structured in a chiasm it's going to, it, and it has part A, part B, part C. Part A is at the top of the X. Think of that, that X as like a, uh, an hourglass. At the top is A. We just studied part A, which was the healing of the paralytic let through the roof. Part B narrows. It's this next section we're going to do. And then part C is in the middle and it has no match. It doesn't rhyme with anything. Below it is going to be uh, part B prime and then A prime. 
So it's going to be structured in a chiasm. Remember, people couldn't read and they didn't have a copy of the text, even if they could. So um, Dasha, if you're writing something and you want people to remember it, they don't, they can't read and they don't have a copy of it. Maybe if you created mnemonic devices inside the text, you can help them remember it and not to remember the entire thing as much as what's the point. If a homily goes in on for 12 to 15 minutes, you don't have to remember word by word by word everything the homily said, but can you, if they did it well, can they recall the most important point? In a chiasm, the most important point is in the middle, is in the intersection. So right now, if you have an X on your paper there, uh, chapter two, verses one through 12 is A at the top at the broad top of the hourglass. We're gonna go now into part B and I'm gonna to have to do it kind of fast. The call of leave, the first part was, was indoors, remember? And the outdoors breaking into the indoors. Now we're gonna be outdoors. And a scene just shifts and Mark as the omniscient, or just, omniscient narrator just says, another time he went walking along. So they're really, it doesn't say later that day, he just, he wants to tell a different story. And so he just changes the scene. Another time he was walking along the sea. People kept coming toward him in crowds and he taught them. As he moved on, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus sitting at his tax collector's post. So he's, he's in his uh, posture of authority. He's sitting at a, a tax collector's post. Um, and he's, Jesus says to him, follow me. And Levi rose and followed. He just did. That's all. While Jesus was reclining to, to eat in Levi's house, where an observant Jew wouldn't have been to begin with, because it's against the rules, and Jesus is defiling himself and all of that, not only was he eating in Levi's house, but Levi invited a bunch of his sinner friends over. <laughs> so the room is just crawling with sinners. Levi and many tax collectors and those known as sinners reclined uh, with his disciples at dinner. That's the first time that word gets used. Disciple is, is the Greek word discipulo, and it's, it's also the common word for a student. Right now, because you're for this hour, you've decided to make yourself a student. You are specifically a disciple at this moment because you're devoting yourself to study. And discipline is one of the characteristics of a disciple. A student who's undisciplined is an oxymoron, would be an unstudented student, uh, an unstudious student, right? So he's, he, his, he's with his, they're not just his followers, but they're there as disciples. They're there to learn. So what are they going to learn? It might be the first time that any of them have ever been in a tax collector's house because if they were observant Jews, they would have known better than to do that. So it's boundary breaking. The number of those who followed him was large. When the scribes who belonged to the Pharisee party saw, saw that he was eating with tax collectors and sinners against the law, they complained to his disciples. Why does he eat with such as these? Overhearing the remark, Jesus says to them, people who are healthy don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call sinners not the self-righteous. Mm -hmm. So in that section, there's, uh, there's an outdoor scene, calling of a disciple. It moves indoors over and becomes a dispute about who's worthy to eat at the table, <clears throat> even though it, it's, it's Matthew's house, I mean, a Levi's house, but some of his own guests feel the need to be critical of him uh, in his own house, which is annoying. Um, and Jesus ends it with a proverb. People who are healthy don't need a doctor, the sick ones do. I've come for the sick ones, not the self-righteous. So in your chiasm, that's B and the narrowing part at the, at the upper half of an hourglass. Now we move to C, which is the part that has no match. So pay attention because this is the crux. This is the center point, the central message of chapter two. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees fasted People came to, to Jesus with the objection, why do John's disciples and those of the Pharisees fast while yours don't? So it's a criticism, it's oppositional. 
hey, wait a minute, we're used to seeing disciples fast and you're not doing it the right way. Jesus replies, how can the guests at a wedding fast as long as the groom is still among them? Right? As long as the groom stays with them, they can't fast. The day will come, however, when the groom will be taken away from them. On that day, they'll fast. So we're nearing the end of the time. If you wanted to take a, one takeaway from this section, should you reread it and pray over it, in the center of the chiasm is Jesus comparing himself to a bridegroom. It's not a, a huge theme in the Gospel of Mark, but it's blown up into enormous proportions in the Gospel of John, which starts with the wedding feast at Cana. And Jesus in John's Gospel is absolutely the one who wants to get down on one knee in front of you and ask, will you marry me? Elaine, we were talking earlier about separation and stuff, and there's, there's no separation between a bride and a groom, especially in their honeymoon suite the night of the wedding. There's no distance whatsoever. The two become one. So he's, boy, is he boundary breaking. And he's not doing that out of the blue because there's different Old Testament passages that talk about God as being espoused to the nation and espoused to each human heart. Uh, there, there, it's, it's not a huge overwhelming theme in the Old Testament, but he's there and he's drawing upon it and saying, think of me this way. Uh, and you're going to need to change your mind. If you stay in those oppositional categories, you're not going to get who I am. Um, as long as you're thinking about who's worthy to be at the table, who isn't, who's an insider, who's an outsider, you won't understand. How can you possibly fast when the bridegroom's with you? The days are coming when the bride will be taken away and you can fast then. Then he goes into some uh, uh, aphorisms. No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old cloak, do you? Now, we might have never done that. You might not have ever had to deal with shrunken and unshrunken cloth, but it was commonplace in the ancient world. You wouldn't put a piece of unshrunken cloth on one that was had been washed many times um, because the next time you launder it, one's going to pull against the other. They're not going to be united. If you do, the very thing you used to cover the hole would pull away the new from the old, then tear would just get worse. Similarly, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. And usually most of us have um, old wine and new wine in the same cabinet. You know, uh, if, you have, if you have any alcohol in your house at all, aren't there some bottles that have been there a long while? and some that you just got this week. Um, everybody knows how to contain old and new. You don't have to uh, pour the wrong thing into the wrong thing. Similarly, what's that? I thought I heard something, but somebody's phone going off. Similarly, no one pours new wine into new wine skins. If you do, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the skins, it just doesn't just mean will spill or be lost. The word is die. You don't think of wine as dying, but the word in the, in the passage is the wine perishes, it dies. So that's the middle of the chiasm. Um, the next section, I'll go through it real quickly, matches, uh, you could call it A, B, C, B prime, A prime. Uh, we're gonna be outside again and eating again and having a proverb again, like we did above. It happened that he was walking through the standing grain on the Sabbath and his disciples began to pull heads of grain as they went along. At this, the Pharisees protest, look, why are they doing a thing not permitted on the Sabbath? And he says to them, have you ever never read about what David did when he was in need and he and his men were hungry? How he entered God's house in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and he ate the holy bread, which only the priest could eat. And then he gave it to his men. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? That's why the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That really chafed them because there were so many rules built up about Sabbath observance and Jesus just kind of blows past them and says, this, the Sabbath is there at the service of humanity, not the other way around, not to make people slavish to rules. Finally, even though we're moving into chapter three, remember the chapter numbers come from the Middle Ages, not the time of the writing. Um, 
he returns to the synagogue where he was at the beginning. Remember, he, um, he was indoors at the beginning. And remember that the Marx community didn't have public worship buildings. They only had each other's houses. So Nancy, we might come to your house because it's bigger than Margot's house. I'm looking at you side by side and it could hold more people. So we might just be used to coming to your house and somebody took the roof off of your house so that somebody, <laughs> the paralyzed guy could get in. Um, he returns to the synagogue, which is another place people gather. There's a man whose hand is withered up. They keep an eye on Jesus to see whether he'd heal him on the Sabbath, hoping to bring an accusation against him. So by the end of this opposition, oppositional section, they're almost hoping he'll heal a guy with a withered hand so they can arrest him. It's only the beginning of chapter three. Mark's, that's why I called it darkest before the dawn. Mark is dark. Jesus can hardly do anything without it causing dark trouble. He addresses the man with the shriveled hand and says, rise up here in the front. He wants to make sure everybody's got a good view. If you're gonna, if you're gonna accuse me of healing somebody with a withered hand, I want to make, can everybody see me? Make sure you got a good view. And then he says, he asks them, now, is it permitted to do a good deed on the Sabbath or an evil one, to preserve life or to destroy it? And at this, they remain silent. He looks around at them with anger, for he was deeply grieved that they had closed their minds against him. And then he said to the man, hey, stretch out your hand. And the man did, and his hand was perfectly restored. The, when the Pharisees go outside, they immediately begin to plot with the Herodians, the followers of King Herod, how they might destroy him. Well, that's all we have time for today. Uh, I didn't get to deal with any of the stuff that came up in the chat, but I'll look at that, uh, and that will be the topic for tomorrow's interaction session. So if any of this... Uh, uh, caused an idea in you. It could be related to the text, to the season of Lent, to one's own spiritual journey, to the how, do, how are you living in a world that often gives you oppositional choices and insists that you must be with me or against me? How are you navigating that? And can you be Christ-like? Uh, are there ways in which doing that will just bring you grief? Are there any groups to which you belong that if you don't pledge your loyalty again, that you'll be ostracized or thought less of, that you're going over to the other side, that sort of thing. All those would be appropriate to this study, okay? So to get on tomorrow's call, it's the same Zoom link. This session, I hope, will be posted on YouTube by the end of the day. Uh, feel free to share the Zoom link and the YouTube link with anybody who you think might enjoy being in the study. Remember, we're only two chapters in. And so if it's not all that late, if someone wants to join in, they could get up to speed. So if you think you know somebody that might enjoy being a part of this, have at it and, and invite them along. Okay. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Now, God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the authority vested in me, go and have a great day. <laughs> bye, Father. Bye, right. Father. Bye-bye. Bye, Father. Bye, Father. Bye, Father.